today on Rambling About Cars. It's the holidays, and we have supercars. We have more supercars. We have Prius pricing. We have listener emails. We have a cheap car challenge, and we have over 400 subscribers, so we also have hot sauce. Without further ado, I don't know how this is going to go. It's podcast time. I am Christopher Smith, and across the way, joining me is Mr. Chris Bruce. Hey, everybody. So, yeah, um, this is our holiday episode. So if you celebrate Christmas, this will be coming out the week of Christmas. Um, and, yeah, if it's anything like our Thanksgiving episode, I know only our hardest of the hardcore listeners will be uh, tuning in for this one. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, there will be quite a bit of listener feedback and listener appreciation during this episode. So it'll be a fun Lots. one. Um, but fun uh, one. we're going to hey, do a... Oh, go ahead. You, you might be listening you know, over the holidays here, spread the cheer. Watch these sure. guys do do crazy weird stuff while talking about cars. So that's right. It's the it is the season. Um, but yeah, so we're gonna start with some news hits, some stuff that's come out, and then we're gonna kind of, like I said, lots of listener comments and then some fun stuff. So without further ado, let's get into the news. And one of the kind of the Smith, this is a car you and I have talked about fairly recently, and that's mm -hmm. the Ford GT, and it is going away. We knew that it was going away. This isn't a surprise, but Ford is saying farewell to it with one more time. G yeah, <laughs> <laughs> saying farewell again uh, with the GT Mark IV edition. Um, let me get this pulled up, but this is a track only special yes. edition, uh, 800 horsepower from a. It, all we know right now, we don't and we know, really, yeah. Well, yeah, it's 800 horsepower plus, I should say. And the other thing is that we don't know is how big the engine is, because Ford says it's larger than the 3.5 liter EcoBoost that's usually in this. And I know our coworker Adrian reached out to Ford about this, and he didn't get a response. And we kind of need to hold their feet to the fire and find out exactly how big this engine is. Um, but yeah, so we know it's more than 3.5 liters and we know it's more than 800 horsepower and yeah. And, and unfortunately it's track only. You're not so. going to see it on the road. Yeah. That's, I mean, if, if you were listening and thinking like, well, wait, the, didn't the last one already come out? Well, yeah. For the road, then they, then they pull this track only version out of their hat. And, um, I mean, it's pretty cool as somebody familiar with the original uh, Ford GT40, the, the whole legacy there. It's cool that they kind of did a nod to the Mark IV. I think it's pretty cool that it's not just a Ford GT with, uh, you know, some different colors, some different graphics. Not that there's anything wrong with the special editions that they did. They're, they're all amazing, I think. But I mean, this one, this is, and, and it doesn't just have more power either. It's longer. It's mm -hmm. wider. It's got big wings, front and rear. It's got the big diffuser there in the back. It has special headlights. It has a racing transmission. It has no side mirrors because I mean, this is this is track only. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, as you can imagine, it's not going to be common at all. They're only building sixty-seven. Why sixty-seven? That's the year the Mark IV came out. The sixty-seven Ford GT forty Mark IV. So a bit of an homage there. And it's $1.7 million. Now, if you have $1.7 million burning a hole in your wallet, like I do, you can <laughs> do, you, you can do, you can do one of two things. You can buy, I don't know, we'll say a 1995 Ford Tour show and try to repair it and hope you have enough money. I, I think you're going to have money left over. I hope if not, I, then... I'm not so sure. I'm not <laughs> okay. so sure about that, Bruce. <laughs> Or okay. you can you can apply to buy this car from Ford because obviously there's only 67. This is going to be uh, I mean, this is going to be a hot seller. I mean, the mm -hmm. the GT, the GT fans, they're going to be all over this. I don't think they'll have any trouble getting through 67. Um, no. And I, there are 67 people out there with oh, yeah. roughly two million dollars in the bank that are going to plunk down the money for this. Can I say something that might be controversial, though? Do you know how Ford, when they when the GT first came out, they had people sign contracts saying that they would keep these cars for a certain period of time and not sell yes. them to mm -hmm. present to prevent pe like uh, people flipping them? 
Mm-hmm. I think there should be a similar contract that anyone who buys one of these should have to take it out in anger on the track at least once. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Not just take it to the track, but in anger. I think that's a very, a you very should, key you, statement. You know, an out lap, a hot lap, and an in lap one time by contract if you're going to buy one of these. Because I I worry that there are going to be buyers that are just going to buy one of these and they're going to shuffle them off into a garage and they're never going to move and they're never going to start and they're never, it's just going to be, you know, a collector's item for mm-hmm. super, super rich people. And that bothers me a little bit. Like if you have that money, you can do whatever you want with it. I'm, you know, I, I'm not going to get into that argument, but also Multimatic and Ford, they've been developing these cars for years. This is the final farewell. And if you're going to do it, if you're going to buy one, you should have to at least experience it one time. I mean, hey, I'm, I'm an enthusiast. I'm right there with you. Cars are built to be driven. Um, but I mean, I also recognize there are people that just appreciate the aesthetics, right? There um, are. And... I guess, I guess, I guess I don't really have much of an opinion. If you want to buy the car to just have it in your collection and look at, I mean, God knows I have plenty of just crap that I collect that has sure. a functional purpose that, oh, I just want to look at it or I just want now, to have, you know, it. What? So I, you know, that, that, that doesn't bother me, but that's true. It, but it, it feels different in some way when it's something that's $1.7 million here. I own the Criterion Collection of Godzilla on Blu-ray that comes in this gorgeous book. <laughs> and I've got to be honest with you, I've never watched any of them because I own them in other formats and whatnot, but I can stream them and whatnot. But so I've owned it and haven't used it. And someone could say the same thing about me. Why are you not enjoying these in this gorgeous format? And you would have an argument, but I paid $110 for that, not $1.7 million for a car. So I don't know. I mean, I mean, maybe it's the other way around. Um, maybe it is. I mean, maybe I, should, yeah, I, I paid used... $1.7 million for this. I'm not taking it anywhere near a wall right. at anything yeah. more than five miles. You know, hey, don't know. Or you could always just be like Bugatti with their uh, with their uh, their Chiron. Um, I can't remember which which trim it is. We just we just wrote the article on it. Um, where before everyone is delivered, like there's a Bugatti uh, test driver that puts like, yeah. uh, like, like a hundred or some miles on it, takes it to its top speed. It's like every one of those cars has been, has been put through the paces, mm-hmm. even, you know, even just once in its life. So take, take a, take a little bit of comfort there if, if you're that sort of person, but I mean, the, the, this thing looks just just mean. It does. I, I would. So I would be like the race car that it. I wouldn't like, be upset just, at people just looking at it. I mean, especially when you see it from the side profile, where it's like, mm-hmm. where it's like half an inch off the ground. I don't know what the actual clearance is, but it looks like it's just just right on the ground. Right. So yeah, it looks like it's just a half a tick off of the Le Mans racer. Like it, you know, it, mm-hmm. they took that and they're like, well, we can't sell that to the public. Let's, <laughs> let's dial it back a little bit. And it's so, I was just like, Boop. and that's what they sold. Like it's yeah. so, it looks so much like that, the actual race car um, that, you know, if you're one of these 67 people and you've got $1.7 million to burn and you get through the application process. So I guess there's several iterations there, but um, you could own one of these. Now let me ask you a question, Bruce. Uh, and, and I want to and I want to point out that this is going to be a little speculative on our part. Um, do you remember? It was probably like maybe five or six months ago, which means it was actually probably around a year ago. The way my memory goes these days, um, one of our one of our spy uh, photographer crews that caught was over a year ago. I think. <laughs> okay, well there you go. Yeah, um, I will pull these fo- the pictures. Up you know now exactly what I'm about. talking about. We yeah. snapped photos of a weird looking Ford GT, and it's like, why is Ford testing a, a GT with camouflage on it? 
and it looks different. It's got a different wing, and the back end is different. And there was well, all this speculation. There, uh, there was all this speculation kind of that uh, that the Ford was going to build a V8 version, uh, you know, for the for the Swan Song. Um, and yeah, I mean that one. The what we saw there was a little different than this. I can't yes. remember if that mystery was ever solved, or if maybe that was a test mule for the car that we see here. I don't know that we ever found out what that car was. I'm trying to pull up or, the or now. I mean, at, at, at the very least, a test mule for whatever engine they're running in this thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah. I mean, I just I, I find it interesting that as we get to the end, like the end of the end at this point, yes, right. Ford did come up with a new or, or a heavily modified version of the Ford GT. That has right. something different going on. Okay, here we're here we're looking at images now. Where are we looking at images? Motor One Podcast on YouTube, where you can go and watch what we're doing. Or if you're listening on Spotify, Apple, Google, you know the spiel. We will try to describe it as best we can. Um, yeah, it's got this big scoop on the roof. It's okay, okay, okay. It, it, it wasn't camouflage, but yeah, it had that weird engine cover on the back. I wonder. I wonder if that was a test mule. It probably was because they probably had to feed a bunch more air into, yep. you, you know, it's more than 3.5 liters. We know that we need to find mm -hmm. out exactly how many, but it's going to need more air to make more power. So that's probably exactly what it is. They probably, some guy at Ford fabricated up a quick roof scoop and put it on to make sure it could breathe enough to, you know, take out for a little test. And how long ago was that? How bad is my memory? Uh, August 11th of 2021, 18 God months ago. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> what? No. Sorry, buddy. You know, that's, that's hey. one thing that that's one thing that the younger generation never understands. Cause I sure as hell didn't understand it then, but it's like the older you get, the quicker time goes. What? How does that? No, that's, that's no, not, that's true. That, man. That's, that's space time continuum stuff. I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. Yep. Um, and now I'm sounding like a properly old man. So let's talk <laughs> about let's talk about jets from the 1960s, huh? Yeah. Like uh, no, crickets. no, no. I was let's, let's talk about this jets from crickets. the 1960s. Let's talk about jets from the 1960s McLaren, and a McLaren Artura. Yes, McLaren and Lockheed Martin kind of gave you a Christmas present this week in that they announced or McLaren announced that it is going to be working on with Lockheed on some sort of supercar project. We don't really know much more than that. And they released these really fantastic pictures. And you are a plane nerd. I am a bit of a plane nerd myself, but you are much more of a plane I, nerd I was, than me. I, I was the executive director for a little while of a nonprofit for an airplane an air force airplane museum. So I suppose yeah. I would qualify as a plane nerd and to be specific, um, McLaren is working with uh, Lockheed skunk works, which if, if you have any sort of interest in aviation, especially on the military side, you know what skunk works is. That's the, that's the, the more secretive division that developed aircraft like, the F-117 stealth fighter, like the U-2 spy plane, like the SR-71 Blackbird, which, even though it retired in 1990, still holds the absolute speed record for a machine with a combustion-powered engine. And I would McLaren, add that we know of there. I, that's just, that, oh, that's just that, my own little conspiracy that we, thing. That we know of. Well, I remember um, I actually did a a college report back in the mid nineties about this nerd alert. We're, we're going to just, we're going to go slightly off the rails here because I found this super interesting. Um, the, the SR 71 blackboard, of course, spy plane developed um, in the late fifties, early sixties. Yep. Um, just an amazing aircraft by Lockheed uh, through the skunk works way, way, way ahead of its time. It was retired in 1990. Every time up to that point when an aircraft was deemed, okay, you know, it's time to, to be retired, the United States Air Force generally put up some sort of fight against it. Here's, you know, here's why maybe we should continue doing. There really wasn't much of a fight when it came to the Blackbird. It was just kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, it's older, we'll move on. 
And it's like, okay, what, what's, what's going on here? You know? And then that was, that was the the speculation at the time that, okay, there was already a replacement. I think they were, they were saying it was like the SR 75 or something. Nobody knows. Nobody, Nobody knows. knows. It's all secretive, but, but that was, that was big discussion back then. And I remember actually doing a report on that way back in my college day. So a little bit of side information, but McLaren is going to team up with them to explore like, futuristic designs for high speed systems on cars. What the hell is McLaren planning to build? Right. The, the, the SR 71 Blackbird, 2,193 miles per hour, Mach 3.3. Uh, I mean, 300 mile an hour barrier. Huh? What? I mean, it, it's, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's more, well, I shouldn't say that. They are working. No, you're probably, with, it's probably just like a branding deal. Like let's it, it, yeah. let's bring our head out of the clouds, yes. or you know, out of the yes. McLaren isn't going to build a, a thousand mile per hour supercar. No, but it's but, nice to think about that mm-hmm. in a way. Like, well, what? Well, the 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 announcement the announcement was very kind of just generalized. Didn't really offer any details. It goes right along with Skunk Works, kind of doing things and you know, you know, on the down low. Um, they apparently have uh, like a software system that's that's really aimed and keyed for um, quickly developing, you know, higher speed systems, you know, higher speed designs for aviation. McLaren wants to try to work with Lockheed to develop that that basis that software basis uh that design system for aviation try to try to use it in an automotive realm in an automotive Mm -hmm. sense um so what does that mean nobody knows does that mean that there will be a a supercar from mclaren using this nobody knows will it have racing applications or practical applications or both nobody knows but I personally think it's very, very cool to have the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works and McLaren doing stuff. I, I mean, I'd like to see Skunk Works work with anybody, right? Yeah, it's fascinating. Like, it, it's super, super fascinating as to what that could mean. Like, you hope it doesn't just mean, oh, this is the McLaren Artura SR71 edition. You hope it's... <laughs> but yes, yeah, we, yeah we, don't, we don't want an SR71 edition. But, you know, it like and what I mean by that, it's just sort of a special edition. They stamp it on. It's got matte black paint and, you know, stuff like you hope it's more than that. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, and I want it to be more than that because it, it it's a fascinating potential collaboration. I well, we're nerding out about this stuff. I was literally listening to an audio book about the SR-71 last night. Um, I will say uh, uh, it is written by the author Annie Jacobson. It's her book, Area 51, and it is about the development of the U-2 spy plane and the SR-71 at Area 51. And it's a fascinating book because she very much is like, no, there's not aliens and stuff there. It's just where like the absolute most advanced stuff the american government can do that's where they put it and it it and she talks to actual people who work there and looks at uh, uh declassified documents and stuff like that and it's it's a really good book and also the audiobook and we're not sponsored by audible so this is not a sponsorship but she reads her own book on audible and she has the most relaxing voice and it's been putting me to sleep for several nights now so <laughs> spoiler uh, not spoiler alert but uh, s- sort of like a you know little little teaser taster here yeah yeah exactly so, so, sometimes sometimes i listen to a little bit of james may oh okay he has just he just has one of those voices, especially like uh like when he was doing the uh um what was oh the reassembler. Uh, okay. It's like putting things back together very slowly. Exactly. And it's just like yeah, you know, if I'm kind of stressed out, put that on and not to say that he's boring and, and maybe no, 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 no. it's not boring at all. Bit, like I fell asleep to- like- just, just kind of totally relaxing. Exactly. I I fell asleep last night to her telling the story of in the 1960s of airplane pilots 
in you know flying commercial jets they would look up and they would see what they would think were ufos and it was actually the sr-71 that it was so high that it was reflecting the sun like the it was the re jets reflecting were in swamp the dark. gas off no, no, no. of no, no, no. sacramento no, no. that would then yeah <laughs> No, this is real. The <laughs> jets were still in the dark because of how low they were. But the SR-71 was so high that uh, the sunlight was still up there and it was hitting that and reflecting down. And so that a lot of the reports, allegedly, according to her book, I, I haven't, I guess, vetted her book. I don't know. But a lot of the reports of UFOs from the 1960s were actually pilots seeing the SR-71 and seeing light reflecting off of that mm -hmm. because it was so much higher than anything else had ever gone. Mm -hmm. And I fell asleep listening to that last night. So well, that, I mean, there I mean, you go, folks. Now you know what I sleep to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, there was that, of course. Um, they did a lot of development on lifting bodies um yes. through that time period out in the desert so you're getting more of the triangular shapes there of course uh lockheed did the f-117 stealth fighter the have blue program was was mm -hmm. going on around that era where you're seeing a lot of the triangular shapes anyways we're getting a little away from cars don't say you weren't it's warned. our christmas episode you weren't warned, like but, i said during um, thanksgiving only the hardest of the hardcore listen so if you're listening right now that's who i assume you are and if you tuned in because Google said, hey, they're talking about Area 51, we welcome you as well. Um, and I tell you what, Bruce, I don't know what, you know, technology wise, this partnership might bring. At the very least, I'm hoping to see some properly gorgeous supercars. Uh, sure. Because because in my opinion, Lockheed has built some of the most just just some of the prettiest aircraft of all time. You go all the way back to World War II to the P-38, which is a timeless design. God, that's um, a the, the lock, the Lockheed Constellation from the 50s, one yep. of the prettiest airliners ever made and uh, with, also, its, with its tri-tail. Yeah, While we're sharing plane stuff, so at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, they have uh, a fantastic museum. I went there, it's probably 13 or 14, but they have a bunch of the old uh, Air Force Ones there. Mm -hmm. Ike D. Eisenhower rode in a Lockheed Constellation, and it was amazing because you could walk through it, and it was the only one of the planes, and I'm, I'm not going to pull up a picture up here because plain talk who cares um but it's got this like humpback shape to it yep. and you could stand up straight in it even as like anyone could like it, it was almost made for tall people and you know you never see a plane like that today but you could just like it, it the amount of headroom in that plane was a fantastic so yeah i don't have any problem with with headroom in an <laughs> airplane bruce what are you talking about this is this is a thing so, uh, our boss <laughs> Seth might might suggest this is a thing. Seth Seth would agree, yes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they, hey, Lockheed Skunk Works, McLaren. I thought that was a pretty cool piece of news. I hope you out there listening did as well. Send totally. us email. Say hey, that was pretty cool. Podcast at motor one That's our email. Yep. You can also um, put so up comments on our one, videos. Do one more. Do one more news piece. We're gonna hit one last piece of news. This one's gonna be on me, Smith. If you could do photos on this one, because. Uh, yeah, because I got to pull some stuff up simultaneously here. We have pricing technically as we're recording this, this is embargoed and that's why we don't have a story to put up for you. Like we usually would. Um, uh, but we have pricing information for the 2023 Toyota Prius. And, you know, usually we don't often do pricing stuff, but this is a vehicle that both in our comments, both to the, um, to the podcast and then also on the website just gotten a lot of feedback on this car. So yep. we thought it'd be worth sharing. Um, they have simplified the lineup just a bit. It was previously four trim levels, L, L, E, X, L, E, and limited. Now it's three trim levels, L, E, X, L, E, and limited. So they, they took away that L trim level. Um, prices, and this is before the destination price, are now going to start at $27,450. That's for the L, E trim. Um, so the previous L was $25,075. So you're looking at what would that be? Two, just, just shy of 2,500 bucks. The LE though was 26,285. So you're talking about 
pay, uh, let's call it 1500 because I'm not good at doing quick math in my head. So <laughs> $1,500 price increase is, you know, that's something but you're getting a much more stylish vehicle, I would say. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not much of an increase for what you're getting. Right. I don't think uh, I don't think it's much of an increase at all. Um, so LE with all wheel drive. So the one I just mentioned was front wheel drive. If you want all wheel drive, that's twenty eight thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars. Previous gen, the 2002, 20, 27,685. So, again, that's basically twelve hundred bucks ish. That's not that much extra, especially when you consider that I should say the destination price is exactly the same. They're both um, 1095 Yes, $1,095. So mm. no change in destination price there. Um, XLE for the new model is $30,895. Uh, limited $34,465. Um, and then... For all-wheel drive for each of those, XLE all-wheel drive, 32295 and limited 35865 Um, So again, that's a the very top-of-the-line all-wheel drive for basically 36 and change once you figure in, almost 37 once you figure in the destination charge. That doesn't seem that bad. There are... Um, a, a few options and packages available, and, and I'm speaking for the top the top end trim. So if you want a digital rear view mirror, that's 200 bucks. That seems pretty reasonable to me. If you want it heated rear seats, that's $350. And there's also a limited premium package, and that gives you advanced park assist a, and a premium, uh, sorry, panoramic view monitor camera system, and that's $1,085. So doing some quick head math here, you're at just shy of what, 39-ish for a fully loaded Prius with all-wheel drive. And I mean, we're, yeah, I mean, we're looking, we're, we're looking at the interior. Now we've been looking at the exterior. Um, I think it's very reasonable considering just how big of a change we have with this vehicle. Right. Um, and the positive response that we've been seeing, um, I mean, for, for how many years, uh, has the Prius kind of been the, just the, not, not the joke, but to, just kind of the, 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 the bad guy in the world of, of enthusiasts. Right. And right. now it's just, people are saying that. Yep. I actually and really like that. I wouldn't, with mind, this I wouldn't mind that. We have some fuel economy estimates. So a front wheel drive LE, that's the base model again, front wheel drive LE, 57 miles per gallon combined. If you want that with all wheel drive, that drops to four, 54 miles per gallon combined. So you lose what? Three miles per gallon. That's mm -hmm. pretty reasonable. Um, the XLE and the limited with all wheel drive, uh, those are the least efficient of the bunch at 49 miles per gallon combined, but you're still kissing 50 miles per gallon. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. And I should say, we don't have information for the plug-in variant at this point, both pricing and fuel economy stuff. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be getting that later, presumably just you know based on the current model it's going to be more expensive but probably also more efficient mm -hmm. um that that seems like a safe assumption we don't i can't say for certain yet but i you know it's probably you're going to get a bigger battery and that's going to cost more but also with the bigger battery you're probably going to get more efficiency so that that's what i would guess mm -hmm. and i mean toyota's never really had much of an issue selling the prius reaching its its target demographic the not, new design not. i think is going to bring i think that will bring just a completely new segment um into the prius fold and mm -hmm. you're going to get a good looking car with decent fuel mileage great fuel mileage decent. actually i mean if you're yeah almost 60 off for the base model that's better than decent in my opinion mm -hmm. if you know if for whatever reason you don't want an EV, you don't want to pay for one, since this is definitely going to be less expensive, this, you know, you, you live somewhere where charging's an issue, but still you want that good gas mileage. This seems like a solution to that. Am I wrong? Like, no, I, no, I, 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 I don't think you're wrong at all. I, I'm really curious to see what the, uh, what the prime pricing is. 
Yeah. Because I, because I think that's going to be of a bit more interest, uh, sure. especially to people that haven't necessarily considered the Prius before, because you're going to have a little more punch with that car with the plug-in hybrid. Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, you're going to be able so, to, yeah. you're, you're going to be able to plug it in. You're going to be able to go more distance on pure electric power. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to have advantages. It's going to cost more like the, you know, it's not going to be cheaper. Yep. That's, that's not going to happen, but yeah. Um, but it seems like even the base model for, for a lot of people, it seems really good. It, I, I, you know, we haven't driven it. None of us have driven it yet on the team. As far as I know, mm -hmm. um, we might have driven a prototype. I, I, I don't think, I, I don't think we've, we've even been in a prototype yet. Okay. Maybe I'm misremembering that, but you know, so I can't say that for certain it, but it looks good. The price seems right. The fuel economy seems good. So unless they just drop the ball somewhere, it seems like it's going to be a good car. We'll just have to wait and see, but they, mm -hmm. they haven't gone wrong yet. And well, <laughs> I, I mean, some people might say, well, you know, they were kind of wrong for a while just with their kind of oddball styling. I mean, that sure. appealed to a certain group. It if, did. if, yeah. if the, like the first and second gen cars, had a really contemporary look of, without trying to go too far in the future. Do you think they would have been, you know, re received better on a larger scale? Cause I mean, I mean, I mean, if you think back to the late nineties, early two thousands, you That's got in a Prius gen. and there was, there was nothing else like it. Um, right. and that's not always that, a good thing. I mean, it, it was certainly distinctive. It made a name for itself as being the future. Uh, but but being that different, I know was off-putting to some people because I spoke with quite a few of them and I knew quite a few of them. Sure. But that second gen Prius was it was an iconic car for its time. Like I don't know if you remember here in like, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio bought a key a Prius. Like it's it was like the car that celebrities drove, even though it was an economy car mm -hmm. um for a little while there. Like it 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 both poisoned the brand to some people and it also made some people embrace the brand that second generation one and i kind of feel like the third generation is where they drop the ball a little bit in my opinion it, I, you know it, you know well, everyone is it's... entitled their opinion but yeah I, that second generation one i think was just such a successful vehicle and did so well and I, I feel like with this new one, they've moved it into a new generation. Like literally, they've moved it into a new generation of people who right. might okay. look at this and consider buying it, not just the vehicle generation. So no, very well spoken, very well said. You hit it right on the head. Not just a new generation of Prius, opening it up to a new generation of people. Are you among like, that look, generation? Well, we're going to find out because we actually have some comments from some of them. But yeah, it seems like a new group of people are willing to consider a Prius. Mm -hmm. And like we just said, it's not a vehicle that breaks the bank. It's not a 70, 80, 90 thousand dollar vehicle. Mm -hmm. You know, it you could have the top of the range Prius for sub 40 grand. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think? This is the uh, this is the point where I tell you to go to podcast. Uh, motor one podcast on youtube this is the point where i tell you to email us podcast at motor one.com and you have been because we have emails to read and we you do. can always you can always comment on our youtube articles or our youtube posts our articles that go up every friday at motor one we're on spotify we're on apple we're on google um i'm been trying to put this off for a while um and i'm I'll be honest. I like I like spicy stuff, but this one makes me a little nervous because this isn't just a, another bottle of Cholula. Uh, so if I've seemed a little distracted this evening, it's because we set up ahead of time. Okay, we'll go through the first half, Smith, and then and then we'll drink our weird stuff for reaching 400 subscribers, which we said we would do. We said we so would do. We're over 400 subscribers. We are we should over. Tell people. Yeah, yeah. We're we're at 405 now. As and, of this recording, yeah. And and we're doing crazy stuff at 405. Imagine what we'll do at a thousand. 
So, and I real quick, I and I pulled these numbers up. In the last 365 days, we have gained 220 subscribers. That's more than doubled where we were this time last year as we're so, recording. So and I have to thank all of steady. those people. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I mean, yes, it is slow, but steady in the YouTube realm, but we've still more than doubled where we were. And that's something that tells you that, you know, it is, I understand that where we're at in the realm of YouTube is not huge, but we are finding an audience and we are Mm, finding, we appreciate enjoy us and, you know, want to listen to us. And we really appreciate that. And if we have to do stunts like Smith drinking hot sauce, and I should say, so I will be, as we're recording, I will be moving tomorrow. So my refrigerator is largely empty. What I did have left was a jar of pickle juice here. Let me, oh I, I'm my on God. the wrong tab. Uh, I, I, uh, yeah, I'm not going to drink all of this, but, and also, uh, oh my God, dude, but I'm fine with this, but, um, Bubby's. Bubby's makes a fine pickle, by the way. Again, not a not uh, any advertisement, but if you want to UFOs, see- Area Fifty One, supercars, and pickles, and Bubby's. Where else are you gonna get this content, folks? So I, I that that kind of makes me a little yeah. So, but but so we, we said is going to do a shot of hot sauce, we, and I am we going said, to drink a healthy bit of pickle juice, and and we're gonna do this right now. So yes, if you're are. listening on audio. Um, and you want to go over to Motor One Podcast on YouTube to see our reactions. Um, I, I want to be clear. I'm, I'm a fan of the hot ones, uh, which uh, uh, heatness.com. We're not getting a plug for them, um, but either. Yeah, you know, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're plugging we're all anything, sorts but, of people that we're not getting money from tonight. I, so. I, I love I love their stuff. So, um, you know, if, if you're a fan, this is Los Calientes Verde. Which, if you follow Hot Ones, I think it's about halfway up their, uh, about halfway up their realm. So, and I've got my shot glass here, which is actually repurposed um, from an A10 Thunderbolt 2's 30 millimeter cannon shell. Smith, so it is a shot. A Let me double check. I haven't packed mine because I have one of those two that you sent me, and if it's in there, I will do the same thing. I've, I've, so I sent a, I sent a lot of these uh, these little shot glasses out. So. Um, <laughs> vamping for you for a little while isn't going to be an issue because I'm, I'm pretty nervous about doing this. I'm going to, I'm going to pour this out here right now on the camera. Let's see. There's, there's a little bit of drop. Oh, this is, Oh my God. Okay. Okay. How much, how much is in there? So um, if you can see here on the camera, so the shot glass here, what's that going to be? That's probably about two inches tall. And I mean, regular shot glass size, two inches tall. It is about halfway full. It is about halfway full of the Los Calientes Verde. Um, and Bruce is pouring out his pickle juice. Wait, wait, wait. I've got. So I I, I think shooter. I think I would rather have I think I would rather have the hot sauce than the pickle juice. I was telling people wait. this is this is filled about halfway. OK, well, I, I, I can't do I, I don't think I can do the whole thing. OK, because this well, is, this is considerably hotter. So are, are you ready for this? I'm going to do two pickle juices. You, you're going to do two? Yeah, because that's... Oh, man. This is much easier for me. Trust me. Uh, okay, well, in celebration, we appreciate you listeners. Thank um, you, subscribers. Thank you for sticking around. Imagine what we'll do at 1,000. So, Thanks, folks. Oh, God. Ah. Oh. Oh. Oh, that was bad. Oh, that was bad. It tastes good, though. Oh, it tastes good. Oh, I left a little bit in there. Let's. Mm. Oh, wow. That's hot. And Smith, since I knew you weren't watching <sighs> one, two. Yeah, my, my. And then I emptied the bottle. I, what? OK. Well done, Bruce. Well done, By Bruce. The way. Bubbies, thank you. <laughs> so what should we do for our <coughs> next subscriber challenge? Email us podcast at motor one.com. Comment on this YouTube video at motor one podcast on YouTube. Okay. Smith Com- comment stop talking. in our articles every Friday that go up at motor one.com. Stop I'm, I'm, talking. Get yourself take, whatever you need to drink. I'm, I will I'm handle take some a little bit of a, here. Get, of, get of whatever is in normal this glass. again. 
But as Smith was saying, podcast at motor1.com is the email address. Motor One Podcast is the YouTube address. Oh, Motor1.com is where you find all of our writing, Smith's writing, my writing, and then every Friday, the post for the podcast. Oh. And as thank you to our readers, well, not so much as thank you to our readers, because we like reading it, the stuff as well. Um, I am going to read some comments uh, that we there, you you did. You recently. did, too. So I feel like I have to do a second one now. You do not have to do a second one because I don't mind drinking that. That's the, st- the I, I, thing. Well, like, I, the, hey, we, we're, we're in this to win this. Right. So if you're going to do two. No, then well, I have to do two. He so, doesn't. So I am so going to keep thank you, talking listeners. while. He burns his stomach to ash. Oh, uh, my God. The second one wasn't sometimes. nearly as bad because stuff is numb now. Well, take that, Sean Evans. You should book me on the next show. OK, we have we've we kind of went off the rails there. So let's do so let's do because we got a lot of emails over the last couple of weeks. We've been busy. We have as you can see here on YouTube. We just did our Motor One Star Awards. We had a special episode a couple weeks ago for the Star Awards. Um, You still want to go to MotorOne.com. You can read all about the winners. Of course, you want to see our podcast where we go behind the scenes on all of that. Um, But in between that and then the special guest that we had last week, um, Myron. Take a drink. Calm your tummy. (laughs) I got this, man. (laughs) Okay. I'm going to just kind of sit back here and cry a little bit. Okie doke. Yeah, that's fine. So this email comes from Jonathan Brown. He is a frequent emailer to us, frequent commenter. So guys, great show. I have a two-year reservation uh, with one of the largest volume Corvette dealers in the country for the EV Corvette Ultium-based crossover that hopefully hopefully mimics the Ferrari Priora Sangue in looks with a 700-horsepower electric motor that tears up the competition. That I... I, I wish you luck. Uh, mm. I wish you luck because I hope that vehicle happens. I don't know. Like we haven't heard that much about that. So I hope that happens, but continuing. Uh, that is the Corvette DNA. My poor wife had to listen to me and during my 25 years of buying many new Corvettes as daily drivers. So when the rumor came around of an EV crossover Corvette, I asked if she wanted one and she answered if she could get in, uh, get it in torch red. So I had my answer. I'm Good hopeful answer. at price. Yep, I'm hopeful at prices close to the Stingray, which ranges from 65 to 105 grand. Um, it'll be one of the early one. I will be one of the early orders if it is produced. Uh, Corvette marketing is smart. Why should Corvette owners buy their spouses, Porsches, Audis, Mercedes, or Alfa Romeo crossovers? Uh, time for GM to cash in after 70 years of building Corvettes. Don't listen to the people who say Corvettes should never be electric or crossovers or four-door coupes. General Motors needs to cash in on the brand equity. Sorry, uh, cash in on the brand equity because once the Chinese start dumping in Europe and then in the USA brand equity, it will be very important for profits. Uh, Time to play that aspect and deliver excellence. Just my opinion. P.S. I have a a Z06 on reservation, a year or two wait with a year long reservation. Uh, Yet I have a feeling that the E-Ray with the hybrid electric all wheel drive uh, set up up front and the LT2 Outback is going to be even quicker than the 600. 70 horsepower dual overhead cam v8 and the z06 almost makes me sad i opted for the z06 and not the e-ray uh the corvette ev lineup will be a huge success after leasing my wife an audi e-tron she's hooked on electric vehicles and quite honestly so am i the instantaneous throttle response throttle response and massive torque is addicting and a lot of fun uh this is the reason tesla owners are so loyal and a good portion of owners it's not about the climate change nonsense it's about the instantaneous throttle response that they love. Uh, hopefully the Corvette crossover and four-door coupe EVs look like either the Porsche Taycan or Ferrari Pro Sangue, yet priced closer to the Corvette Sangre to start, he says, $65,000 to $105,000. $105, Fun show, guys. Keep up the great work. Get the show working, Smith. Do a photo and video piece <laughs> on it and give us updates along the way. Multiple updates would be cool. We love these types of project updates. Uh, the news is great about the Acura NSX. Oh, the news about the great NSX being canceled mm. is sad. Sorry, I misread mm, that. Yes. 
Yes. Its gestation was just too long. It needed a convertible version too, priced a little too high, I think, as well. It should have been offered with a twin turbo V6 at a lower price or just full electric. So he's basically saying not uh, take away the hybrid. Uh, dual powertrains are overly expensive, at least for Acura. Uh, my Audi e-tron GT has a range of 250 miles, and it's more than enough fivefold. The average American, 78%, only drives 40 miles an hour, 40 miles a day, sorry. Uh, we just charge at home, although with the app, there are tons of chargers available all over. They are just hidden unless uh, you have the various apps. I bet most charging stations go belly up because they're own because most owners only charge at home or at the free station at malls, etc. The recharge speed is already reaching 80% charge within 18 minutes. Uh, within 18 minutes. Um, Long-winded email. Happy holidays. Please pick and choose whatever you find applicable. Jonathan Brown. So well, I read the whole well, thing, Jonathan, because yeah, it was a Christmas you for show. That. Thank you for that. And I love how I think there was more email after the, the postscript PS than than the, the actual in, email in, in, the, in, in the beginning. Um, we love emails like that. So much, we so do. many great points there. Um, and of course, it's timely because uh, it was what just a couple weeks ago or so, Bruce, where we had um, that that big that big uh, E Ray leak uh, yes. from from yes. Corvette's own website from their visualizer um, yep. that you can check out at MotorOne.com, obviously, uh, where we got a preview. I mean, it wasn't wasn't detail that we didn't have no. details on on what's going on underneath, but um, sort of like a, a a little bit of a preview look there. Um, with with the EV, the the charging, that's something that I wish more non EV people would uh, would kind of grasp, um, especially right now these days where we have the F one fifty Lightning and Rivian and you know a lot of the truck people saying, well, I'm I'm it's going to cut my range down if I'm towing and I'm going you know two or three hundred miles, I won't be able to do that. Well, the technology is progressing there, but. Right now, the vast, vast, vast majority of people, you're driving your car, you're commuting back and forth to work. Right. Most of your charging is taking place at home. Now, if you're taking a longer trip, if you're taking like a, a longer vacation, is it going to be a little tougher to, to charge up? Sure, it will. But there are stations out there where you can do it. Yes, you don't have the same kind of freedom to say, well, you know what? I think I want to jump off the highway and, and take it take a hundred mile jaunt up here to see the largest ball of twine in the world. <laughs> and, and I'm not, and I'm not trying to be ridiculous there. I mean, no, I, what, what, when I travel, yeah. If, if I, if I see something I want to go see, Hey, I'll jump off the, you know, the highway and go see it. You won't have, have quite that flexibility yet, but keep in mind, we're at the very beginning. I mean, we're, we're still kind of in the, in the early stages of this. So um, great points all around on, on the EV talk. I'm curious. I'm curious to hear from more Corvette owners on the prospect of a Corvette crossover mm -hmm. um, or, or or a Corvette sedan. You know, some of the rumors that have recently resurfaced have been saying. Um, I mean, I I know front and center how the Mustang people felt about Mach E, and I really would like to hear from more Corvette people on how they feel about the Corvette being a larger brand, where you have your your small traditional sports car, supercar, two seats. Um, and then you have a crossover and then you have a sedan podcast motor one.com email us in. We want to hear more about it. Yeah. I would love to hear more opinions on that because mm -hmm. you know, I, I am not a Corvette loyalist. I've never owned one to no one that I can directly think of in my family has owned one. So I would not, it, it's not a mark that I especially have a big tie to. So I'd be curious to understand better how people are reacting to the possibility of it changing. Hmm. Want me to uh, take the next email, Bruce, because well, no, I, can, I, I can, I can speak. I'm, I'm alive and well at this. The second shot of hot sauce really wasn't that bad. The first one, I think kind of just, just, burned and numbed a lot of stuff so i'm i'm good well let here i'll tell you what let me do one more i i, I i'm gonna triage you uh, let me make sure that you're you're healthy enough <laughs> for email reading activity before you need to you read take that on you need to read lee's email because that's, that's what i'm looking like, at okay that's right up your alley 
Yep. So dear ramblers, and this is from Lee, dear ramblers, thanks again for the great work that you do with pulling the podcast together every week. It's always a great blend of commentary and knowledge mixed with some good laughs along the way. Uh, keep up the great work. Looks like 101 episodes and counting. That's awesome. You've posted a couple of questions across a few podcasts, and here are my thoughts for you. Subaru. Back in 2021, we picked up our first Subaru. It's an Outback similar to what I to what Mr. Bruce, right? You you can call Mr. Bruce might be better since if you say Chris, we're not going to know who you're talking about, but huh? Bruce is fine. Uh, picked up recently. Um, I have some similar thoughts on this. Subaru seems to be nudging itself further and further up the ladder of Nisus. I think their Outback is probably their premier vehicle, maybe the Ascent, he puts in uh, uh, parentheses, and it has been made more quiet, more comfortable, and still seems fairly capable for what it is. I was shocked when I found an online image of a lowered outback it became obvious that subaru has very subtly been tuning their car uh into somewhat into something sorry that could be more easily mistaken for a nice european wagon and profile it just happens to be lifted uh take a look at the sweep of the rear glass for example and they only make small changes and tweaks as they go uh they're content in uh, they're content to keep elevating it slowly it seems and they're getting there as a quick side note our outback is uh half the the automotive journalist dream. It's brown, cinnamon pearl <laughs> in Subaru speak. It's a wagon and is only missing a diesel engine and stick. Is there a swap for that? And I actually <laughs> look sure there for the current one. There is not for the previous generation. It was possible in some markets, specifically the UK to get a wagon and a stick. How many of those were actually made is probably incredibly small, but tech, Technically, a previous gen outback in brown with a stick and a diesel could technically exist. Um, so I looked that up for you, Lee. And last part, Prius. Wow, I was floored by the new Prius. It is so much better looking than the Prius one, or previous one. Sorry, I don't have a good case. I don't have a good use case for it. But at the same time, I wouldn't hate having it. And it just looks kind of well, nice. Yeah, he's right. I think Toyota has broken a fundamental thermo thermodynamic law here. Aren't all refreshes and new models supposed to look worse each time? No, they don't have to. There are plenty of cars that look better when they're, the new model comes out. It's just the Prius has been it's boring, I guess, for so long. Or so uh, polarizing. I think polarizing is, polarizing is, so is, is, is a better word. And what, essentially what they did was, if you look at it, they they just moved everything back. They made it look more like a sports coupe and less like kind of a awkward sedan and that's all it needed. Once you did that, I would love to speak to the designer who came up with that idea because that person fixed it. Like, I hope that person just like walked into the design studio and was like, guys, why did we just do this? Let's just move this line back like <laughs> four or five inches. And it's, it's great now because that's essentially what happened. So, yeah. Well, and, and I mean, I've said it before. Uh, I think we both have said it before. It feels like with this generation Prius, Toyota decided, okay, everybody else has sort of caught up in terms of electrification and right. the hybridization. Instead of trying to imagine something further in the future, let's just create something cool right now. Yeah. Because I, I don't feel like they're trying to make the Prius stand out has something fantastical and from the future. Right. They're just making a good looking car that happens to be a very efficient hybrid. And it's always been a very efficient hybrid. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in that respect, they're making it stand out even more because it's not what the previous Prius has been. Right. Yeah. So I, to build off of that, you know, when the Prius arrived, it was kind of it and the Honda Insight. And those were the hybrids available. Mm -hmm. Even electric vehicles at that time were very, very few and far between. And so it looked like nothing else on the road, but in a bad way, almost like it called out to itself. Like you said, oh, that person bought a Prius because, you know, they wanted to stick out or whatever. Now, hybrids or mild hybrids are incredibly common. And so there's no point in designing a vehicle to 
call itself out as a hybrid, especially for Toyota when they have RAV4s and Camrys and Avalons and, uh, you know, a bunch of hybrids in their lineup that don't look any different than the combustion powered versions. So they, it, it feels like there must have been a meeting and said, okay, let's keep the Prius name, but let's, you know, we don't have to make it look, we, we don't have to make it look electric or special, or I, I can't think of a good way to say it. Let's just make it look cool. And that's what they did. Yeah. And, uh, and as we've said in this episode and previous episodes, I think they got it right this time. So Lee, thanks totally. much for that email. Um, we love getting that feedback. We have two emails from our friend Eric from across Both the Both of them are here. quite long. So, Smith, I I think we're you – know, go ahead and read these two, but I think we need to edit a bit. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start with the older one. And Eric's going back through the archives of Rambling About Cars because I mean, this episode that you're listening to right now as you head into the holidays here – it's episode 103. That means there are 102 others that you can go back and listen to and get your rambling about cars fix on. We love Eric. Uh, we love you for doing that. We encourage everybody else, especially some of the really early episodes where Bruce and I are just being really silly. It's hey. It's oh, you been... mean not like doing shots of pickle juice <laughs> and uh, hot sauce? That's not silly. <laughs> that's not really that's well. not silly. That's not silly. Okay. Do, doing doing like the really mild sauce was silly. Okay. This the the this the the Los Calientes that I mean that was just stupid. So um, <laughs> we're, we're all good. There. Eric says, "Hey guys, I'm here again with more feedback. This time, episodes ninety and ninety one. So we're, we're we're back a little ways there. Yeah. Large part of ninety was filled with massive trucks, which I'm not really an expert on. Over here in Europe, a Ranger is already quite big, and an F-150 Ram, most common here, looks downright massive. Well, I tell you what, speaking as an American that grew up with the smaller Ranger, the I, I think the new Ranger over here is probably about the size that an F-150 used to be, like maybe I, I bet tw- it's every twenty. Bit. 20 or 25 years ago, Bruce. Like I, if you part- I was going to say a late nineties F one fifty is probably the same size. as a modern Ranger. Yeah. If you, if you put like a, a mid, a mid or late nineties Ford F one fifty next to a Ranger, they're probably pretty close in size. Pretty close. Yeah. Um, but of course you Americans have a class above that too. Yep. The 2,500, the 3,500s over here. We just get a van at this point, but none of those come with a V eight. So I guess you have it pretty good. Yeah. You can say that. Maybe sometimes when gas isn't too expensive. Also, the old Silverado was horribly ugly. I'm glad they fixed it to some extent. Um, talking about the facelift on the on the Silverado HD that Bruce, if I remember, I think we both agreed that it was definitely a step in the right direction for Chevrolet on that. We did. Yep. Um, coming back a bit closer to my wheelhouse, the Mitsubishi ASX. The old one was already a bizarre site built in partnership with Peugeot Citroen, producing perhaps two of their least successful models ever, the 4008 and C4 Aircross. In their best years, they sold four and 12,000 respectively with over 200,000. What is that? Kwashis? I can never, I can can never remember, remember how to pronounce that. I think it's Kashkai. I don't, I'm guessing as well. Sold in the same year, um, while the French twins were quietly discontinued in 2017, but the somehow more successful 45,000 peak sold Mitsubishi soldiered on until 2021, going through several facelifts in its 10-year run. It was kind of the European Dodge Charger. I love that. <laughs> it just, it just, hey, stick, you know, and maybe more automakers should do that. You have a successful formula, stick with it for a little while. Keep bumping it, keep doing little things to just make it interesting, but you don't always necessarily have to completely change up the formula. Um, so some good insight there. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, talking about the BMW XM, horribly ugly. I don't know. Is it horribly ugly? I, a, a lot of people say it is, uh, but better than the IX. Massively powerful, heavy, large, but if you consider its rivals, the likes of the Bentley Bentayga and the Ferrari Pro Sangue, but then you remember the Porsche Cayenne exists, and suddenly there is no point in buying the XM. I don't what do you know think about, about that, Bruce? That part. Uh, 
he had me, he had me, he had me, and then he lost me at the end there. Well, but People Will has it's the most powerful SUV for sale, and it looks obnoxious, which is what they want. It's just a shame we never got another M supercar, um, you know, after after the I'll M one because the, I mean the part. XM technically is, is the, yep it's it's the second M specific vehicle after the yep. M one, but it's not a successor to the M one by any means. No, um, no, yeah, 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 not a successor. I, I mean. The, maybe there's a point there um, that bears just a little bit of discussion before we move on. Um, X, XM, Pearl Sangue, the Bentley, the Cayenne. The Urus. I, I, I mean, the, like you could, you could even add a few to that. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, what, I mean, what's, what's going to, what's going to pull people to the XM over, over these other choices? I mean, it's far more chiseled in terms of styling. It's just far more upright and brawny. Yep. Um, you know, it, it's funny that it's made in Spartanburg, which is in, oh man, South Carolina, right? Yes, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. That Because it looks like such an American vehicle that, you know, if you kind of change the nose a little bit, you could probably sell someone on this being an American, you know, muscular crossover rather than a German one. Um, so I think that will sell it though, as well. I think some people like a tough looking vehicle, um, you know, over some of those other choices. So, you know, I, I look, if you look at this segment, they are all finding buyers, whether we're talking about yep. Urus, Bentayga, That's true. you know, the XM is just, as I popped up here, it's literally just now starting production. So we don't know how it's selling yet because it's not really selling yet, but all of them so far have sold because there are people out there that want a vehicle in this segment. And there's no reason to think that the XM is going to be any different. It's just going to appeal to someone who maybe wants a tougher looking vehicle, a brawnier, more musk. I, I don't have the right words to express it. I don't feel like, but you know, it'll it's be a, a good alternative in that class. I think. Well, and it'll be very interesting to see how that all plays out going forward to see what, uh, I mean, what kind of market share the, the XM gets. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm going to jump ahead quite a bit actually to Eric's more recent email um, because there are some inter interesting points in here uh, that I want to talk about. This goes over episodes 92 and 93. Um, if I remember correctly, we were talking about uh, some zombie cars. We were talking about just some of the, some of the vehicles that have been out of production for a while, but yet we're still seeing uh, new car sales. Um, if I remember correctly, it was the Dodge Dart that, that was yep. really getting us where it's like, okay, it's been like seven or eight years since the Dart was made. Who is still selling this thing new? Um, and who's still buying it as well? And, and, who's, like, and who's still buying it? Uh, zombie cars in Europe, there are not many cases as extreme as the ones you brought up like the Dart. So I'll just list some cars that have sold in comically low numbers. Um, Volvo V40 canceled in 2019. They sold four the Lexus RC still technically on sale. Five sold Mitsubishi Outlander canceled in Europe. Nine sold the Jeep Cherokee. The ugly one, <laughs> the facelift never made it here. Two of them sold a Tesla model S and X three and five sold might go up with plaid, but so I don't know where he's from. Though, while. It, my impression is that Norway, those things were selling like hotcakes, but it might depend on what specific european market he's referring to but. um let me double check i th i think he uh I, I think he told us um in one of these messages where he was at but i mean def definitely over definitely over in in europe there um, oh totally yeah i'm just yeah. like different european markets are buying things yeah. in different because uh, i could have sworn the s and x were selling like you could bear, they could barely keep them in stock in like Denmark and Norway, those two specifically, I believe. But mm -hmm. um, I could be mistaken as well. I Eric know. is in Estonia. Okay, Eric. Yeah. Eric's listening to us in Estonia. So thanks for listening. Spread the word over there, rambling about cars. Yep. Um, let me just touch a couple other things here before we move on, um, because we were also talking about what kind of classic or other vehicles would we electrify oh, pull the gas yeah. engine out put you know swapping something electric i was playing the troll and said i would do it to a dodge demon you did um 
uh, and here's what Eric says. As for electrifying classics, I think the key is to find cars where the engine isn't a defining characteristic. So in some way, the Demon was a good choice, given the engine takes the back seat behind the sheer acceleration of that thing. Um, and nothing but accelerates better th than acceleration. Yeah, but you can yank that engine out. Drop I in know. an EV with instant torque, you know, an electric motor. That said, he, I wouldn't tear the engine out from a Challenger unless it's a V6. The XJS, yes, the V12 is an important part of the car. And the Z, you can't not love the inline six. Um, his proposals. His proposals include more luxurious cars that would be improved by making them electric. Uh, Citroen DS. He's right, 100%. I saw that Cit suggestion. Citroen was... DS. You pull the Thumbs engine up. out, electric motor in there. I, I would go with that. Yep. Uh, one was made recently, saw it in the news, thought it was a perfect fit. Um, next things come to mind are the horribly underpowered Corvettes, Mustangs, Firebirds of the 70s and 80s, which need oh. some power to match their great sure. looks. I'm a fan of the Mustang, too. I know you are. And, like, I, and, and, and I would... A C3 Corvette. With and, 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 I would, and I would approve... I would approve uh, an e an electric swap for the uh, yeah. for the 130 horse five liter. Um, I would consider it for the Corvette, maybe a C3. But I mean, you like can build you can like build a, a you can build a yeah. C3 with I mean with side pipes. Just go full 70s. I wouldn't do it with a Firebird. I I might do it with a Camaro, but I wouldn't do it with a Firebird because <laughs> you still for a period you still have that shaker hood, uh, yeah. you know, with a 6.6 .6 liter. And I mean th that wasn't terribly underpowered i mean it's not right it's not muscle car era you know big block power but i mean those cars were still around 200 220 horse i think um you know at at their lowest point the the, the 70s well i guess the 80 trans am that was probably the low point because i think the biggest engine there was the the, the or the highest output engine was the turbo v8 which was terrifically unreliable and about 200 horse uh but yeah, but he's got so, a point here because, like, I immediately think, what about like a '78 Lincoln Continental, where it's just a land yacht, just a big, horribly boat, just, underpowered. Just put just put a motor in there, just an electric motor, nice, yeah. quiet, float along. Well, I mean, and he mentions that too. Some of the like like '50s American luxury cars, uh, '59 Cadillac Eldorado. May okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that could be some good applications right there. Um, there's there's more. Maybe we can try to get to, to some of the more some of your emails a little bit more, Eric, next time. We're running a little bit long right now. Uh, but thank you so much, everybody, for sending these emails in, giving us some things to talk about, um, taking us in different directions to think about things that we wouldn't consider before. You can be a part of this. Email us podcast at motor one dot com or comment on our YouTube page, Motor One Podcast, or comment on our articles that go up every Friday. Now, we are headed into the holidays, and we, we wish everybody happy holidays, whether you're celebrating Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, any one of the special events that are going on this time of year. We welcome and we open our arms to all of you. And Bruce and I are opening our wallets to each other, to each other. Um, metaphorically speaking here, because it's Correct. pretend we're it's, not it's actually doing it. We're, it's right. pretend, it pretend money. If I had the means to do it, I would probably buy myself something really nice and get something for you. That's not as nice. No, if I had the means to do it, I would buy you every single car that I put on my list. We're doing a cheap Christmas car challenge where we are going to buy a car for the other person. And we say cheap, but it's Christmas time and everybody right. always overextends at Christmas time, right? That's the holidays, right. whatever you celebrate, everybody always overextends at this time of year. We've been so we have some cars. Year, we, something. We, we have some cars, um, or at least I have some cars because I can I only have one, one for you, bud. Sorry. You only have one. Okay, well, I'll, I'll give you a choice of some because I couldn't decide because I think and this is sort of a test, too. It's like. Have we been listening to each other over the past year and a half or so? We've been doing this, right? Do do I know what kind year of year and a half Bruce we was? are kissing? What we're almost at a hundred. We're almost at two years of episodes. Okay, 
Remember earlier in the in the podcast when I said, yeah, memories? <laughs> yeah, because if this is episode 103, our next episode is 104, 52 times two. That's two, two years, years of episodes. Okay. I, I write, man. I don't do math. Come on. <laughs> I don't do math, um, which is probably why I have a bunch of cars and I couldn't decide on them. So why don't, why don't you go first? Okay. I, I will show you. So, okay, now I got to open. Now you made me feel bad. I'm going to open up the other tab I had open and get you the more expensive one. I'll show oh, you both. Oh, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. So, I have got you, I know you want it, a 300ZX Turbo. I knew it was I, coming. I knew it I was coming. I couldn't find Look you a 280ZX Turbo. I tried. They just like, Look at that, though. Look on at the that. internet, they don't exist. 25 grand, which seems like I remember, like, uh, this is me, old man speak. I remember when these were five to eight thousand dollar cars all day, every day. Like, like when we when we started this podcast, they were. Yeah, it felt like that's yeah. how quickly yeah, yeah, they've, yeah. they've shot up in value, man. But, you know, this is a nice one. I can't fight that. This is a very nice example. Um, T tops. You know, turbo V6 looks nice, look, well detailed. Yeah, that. That's that is just fantastic. Yes. Um, I will show you the other one. The V6 turbo. Mm-mm-mm. So that's an 84. The other one is also an 84. It is a bit less expensive, but honestly, I I I always wonder about like the dealers and stuff that post car places. There's for some reason I like the idea of like talking to someone about a car, like talking to yep. the owner. But so this one is 12 grand. Um, it is it's, also a, a turbo here. My I'm having some image photo issues here. Click to enlarge turbo five speed. Yep. Mm-hmm. This one's in Virginia. Clearly a private owner. Also, though, in very nice condition the inside. needs a little bit. of it, it needs a little tender love and care, but it's not, you know, for half the price of the other one, 12 grand still feels high, but this one I, is I would in, I would be happy to save you a little bit of money and get that one instead. Look at that digital instrument. That cluster. dash is so awesome. That is just that is everything wonderful about the 1980s. It really is. And he's got receipts and stuff for it. So yeah. Um, so those are my they're both 84 300 ZX turbos. Well, uh, thank you, Bruce. That was that's a very, very generous Christmas gift. Very so it's generous. My turn. I get to. Send, so let's. So presents. let's see. So let's see if I've been paying attention. A uh, spoiler okay. alert. I'm going to show you this one, but this isn't the one I'm going to buy you. Okay. This is a 1979 Mazda RX-7 limited edition with only 4500 dollars almost 34000 it's 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 not the money i mean it looks fantastic from no, every No what has happened that was when you and i started it, this show that was a $9000 car Bruce this has 4500 original miles okay that helps this that's, is, that's part I of it i mean this could be one of the lowest mile okay RX-7s in the world I didn't um, know that, but it's it's even more special than that. Wait, um, I need to you, see the inside. Does it have it, the visual, the equalizer on the uh, the tape deck? Because those are the good ones. I I don't think it does. A seller didn't include the inside. Come well, on, l- seller. Let me let me let me explain here a little further why I okay. can't buy this one because I, I shop the the seller as much as the car. Right. Yeah. And this amazing 1979 Mazda RX-7 is powered with a six cylinder that is believed to have 105 horsepower. Don't you just want to hear that? Don't you just want to hear that six cylinder RX-7 with only 4,500 miles? Just scream it's six cylinder. But yeah, you showed me an engine view. This does not have an engine swap. That 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 should be. Yeah, that's that, that's totally it's, it's, a, it's a 12A. It's a 12A. Yeah. Totally. It's a twelve A. In fact, there's a there's a tag. There's a picture of the tag that even has twelve A on it. Oh, there, there's a picture oh, of the radio. Oh, and it's got the base radio. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm yep. gonna base, be base I'm gonna look a horse in the mouth. So yeah, 
can can you really buy a Mazda RX-7 from a seller that's listing it as a six cylinder, right? Yeah, so, there's a lot of problems with that one. So I did a little more shopping. Okay. And I did a little more thinking. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. Does it have to be an RX-7? Not necessarily. So I found this. 1974 Ooh, Mazda RX-3. RX3 in Montgomery, I'm Illinois. Interested. For clean clean title one owner is high ish but those things are rare nine. and they're most of them have rusted away and this one's in good condition i like green jewel yeah. green i mean it's got oh it's got the original paper where okay yeah look at you're that. talking me into this one look at that rx3 Ooh, look at yeah. that interior huh yeah it's got it's, it's just got the the nice sort of green with black and on the interior green outside it looks like it sits up a little high did they did they sit up in that the high back? Originally? It looks like they might have, you know, kind of jacked it up a little bit, but yeah. It's got, it's all got, there though. Got got the 12A in it. It does. I mean, it, I mean, it looks clean. They have pictures underneath no. the, uh, the the yeah. the floor mat there, the floor, the floor looks solid. Crank windows, yeah. That's a pretty cool I'm car. I'm on board. That's a pretty yeah. cool car. That's a pretty cool car. But I don't know if I want to buy you that one either. Okay. So I thought, well, what else might be out there that uh, that Bruce would like? I got a feeling you found me a Cressida wagon, didn't you, after our discussion last week? I did not find you a Cressida wagon. Okay. I am having I am having some minor computer difficulties here, um, but I can tell you, I did find you something that starts with a P and ends in Orsh. Or okay. Orsha. 944, maybe? maybe Better 90. for you. Better for you. Late 90s, 911. Oh, 914. How about a 74 914 Bumblebee? Okay. Black with the yellow. Look at this thing. I'm on it's board. Survivor. It's all original. Yeah. 78,000 miles. Uh, yeah, I'm on board. I mean, I mean, 78,000 I mean, miles. That's it. That's a That's low mileage. I mean, it's the ugliest Again, you Porsche buy ever, the, but but no, it's not. I, I, it's I'm, not. I'm buying That's it for you. Called the 924. The 924 is the ugliest Porsche ever. I, I I almost I saw a really nice looking 924, and I was thinking about. Ooh, that. it's clean as just. Yeah, the underside is nice under and tray. clean, nice and clean underneath, black interior, and of course the Bumblebee. Um, we're not talking transformers. We're talking about no, it's just scheme. a bumblebee paint. It's black and yellow. It's yep, black yep. body with yellow, uh, with, with yellow, like stripes yellow striping Porsche, uh, on, on the bottom on side. Yep. Yeah. I'm on board. Oh, it looks like yeah. he's got a little bit of an exhaust on there. Maybe. Oh, it's yeah. some Coney shocks. So it's little, been loved. Little, it hasn't little been, exhaust. Just been little sitting exhaust. around. So there yeah, you go. That's the winner. Is, is that the winner? Yeah. Of the Cause, three, cause, that's the winner. Because there's well, there there's actually one more. Oh, there's that, one that, more okay. that I couldn't I really know. decide on. Oh wait, maybe there isn't one more. Maybe I forgot to save that one. It was a weird. It was a weird Porsche powered kit car. Anyways, you probably wouldn't have. Won no, it. okay, nine fourteen. You, you nine, nine, the best for nine, last. nine fourteen. It is right there. Happy holidays, Bruce. The happy holidays to you, <laughs> and happy so, holidays to everybody out there as you're heading in to this special exactly. weekend. We really appreciate being part of your festivities. Put us yeah. on. Let let the whole family listen to these crazy exactly. people. Look, kids, um, you can grow up and you can drink hot sauce like that idiot in the ugly Christmas sweater. Uh, so real quick, a preview for the next episode you guys will be seeing. And that is, uh, so we've actually done this the last two years. So there's no reason to break tradition. We will do our roundup of the biggest news from... It'll be 20, 2022. Sorry. It mm -hmm. hasn't quite happened yet. So I had to do some that math. That juice is going to your head, isn't it, Bruce? Exactly. Um, so, yeah, we will do a roundup of the biggest automotive news from 2022, whether it was debuts, whether it was corporate news, whether it was cool stuff, just whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it, for anyone out there who happened to listen to it, our very, very first episode in 2021, it was a roundup of 2020 news. We did the same thing last year, and we're going to do the same thing in the new year. So, um, yeah, uh, we will start the new year by looking back on the previous year, and then we plan on continuing the show. Uh, 
least as far as I know, unless something happens. But yeah, we're a <laughs> hundred. We will be a hundred and four episodes deep, and keep up this train on a going. And we appreciate you, folks. So thank all of you, and yeah, we will be seeing you. So good afternoon, good evening, oh, or good night. No, I good not- afternoon. You 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 took my intro. You said without further ado, after I say without further ado, I do pay all attention. Right, all right, all so right. I got to so, say good afternoon, good evening, or good night. There you go. I am going to find a new intro. I, I got tired of the Truman Show one. I said this weeks ago. I've been trying to think of something good and clever that the thing is with that is that it's perfect for both just that that movie and then also for a podcast because you never know when someone is listening to a podcast. Sometimes I listen to podcasts at night to fall asleep. Sometimes I listen to them during the work. Sometimes I listen to them to them during a drive. Like it, it could be at any time. And whenever I am listening to one, I appreciate the people who are putting them out because they took the time to make them for me. So that's why good afternoon, good evening, or good night just works so well. But I got to find something better because I've just gotten bored of saying it after 104 episodes. So I well, will you, find something else. You come up with something different. I'll come up with something different. Or if you listeners out there, you ramblers out there, if you have something different, podcast yeah. at motor one.com there you go all right bye bye everybody thank you so bye. much we'll see you